Welcome back to the Ultraviolet Tide and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you guys so much for joining us again this week for another episode of the Ultraviolet Tide. We're super excited to have you back and to dive into another episode. Today, you just have Snigda and myself, and we're going to dive into a couple different topics. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about our crowdfunding campaign. So if you guys have been following along, our 45-day crowdfunding campaign is in the final days, uh, which is very exciting. So we're going to touch on that a little bit and ways to get involved if you're interested. And then we'll dive into some recent recent skin cancer news um, that we think is super fun and exciting and ways to engage with us. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about Black History Month, uh, which is all of February's Black History Month. And we're going to talk about as that relates to skin cancer. Uh, so we think this week's episode is going to be packed full. And Snigda, I'm excited. I am very excited and happy Valentine's Day, everyone. I hope <laughs> it's going well. So we wanted to kick things off with a little bit of a shameless plug um, for our crowdfunding campaign. So like I said, it was a 45-day crowdfunding campaign, and there are three days left. So you have until February 17th to support us on our mission to continue to bring safe and fashionable sun protective apparel um, to you and your family and your friends and keeping everyone safe. Uh, we have 30 backers already, which is just absolutely incredible. Um Snigja and I were talking about this before we got started, that the fact that we had 30 backers join us and support us is just mind boggling. And we are just so thankful and grateful. Um, and it makes us feel so loved and supported that you decided to join us on this journey. And even for the people who weren't able to donate, we had countless people sharing on social media, which is just as impactful to share the mission. Yep. And I think we're incredibly thankful because it just continues to build and expand our community, which is at the core of LUV. So we're, we're very thankful. Mm -hmm. And you are rocking one of the rewards today. So we have a couple different rewards that people can choose from. And you are rocking the pink baseball cap. And that is one of three total rewards. So one's a baseball cap, one is the Outshine Skin Cancer shirt, and then a third package has both of them combined. Mm -hmm. So if you are so willing to donate, if you if you would like to before the campaign ends, um, you have like four options. One of them is just a regular monetary contribution. The second is um, a contribution that will, in reward, get you one of these bad boys. Um, the third is a, um, the reward is the long sleeve outshine skin cancer shirt. Um, we've had the short sleeve version in the past, but now we're bringing it back in long sleeve. Um, so that'll be, that'll be fun. And the last option is a support bundle, which you would get the long sleeve t-shirt and the cap as well as a bundle. Yep. And you can choose your color of the baseball cap too. So we're doing a navy color, a pink, and then a light blue. And the pink and light blue we have launched before and they sold out super, super quickly. So we were bringing them back for people who were on the wait list who wanted that. And then we added in a navy color because people were requesting kind of a darker tone. So we thought navy would be fun addition, be a fun addition. Um, so you have the choice of baseball cap and then the long sleeve shirt and you know, we are at 7.5% of our goal right now, and we understand the economy right now. You know, everything's kind of moving in slow motion, um, but we're really hoping to get to 10% of our goal. Uh, so if you can donate, please do. These rewards are only available through this crowdfunding campaign. So we're not going to bring them back as part of our product selection on our website. It is made to order for this campaign only. So if you're interested, Please support us and get some swag as well. So switching into some recent skin cancer news. So we have one that I'm excited to share because it's about the Claire Marie Foundation. And we partnered with the Claire Marie Foundation back in the fall. Was it October, Snigda? Yes, early October, yeah. Early October at Virginia Tech. So we had a pop-up shop 
um, just outside of Virginia Tech's campus in Blacksburg, Virginia, and the Claire Marie Foundation reps from Virginia Tech joined us. So we had a pop-up to shop the apparel, and then the Claire Marie Foundation reps were there to hand out resources and answer questions and everything. And it was such a fun collaboration. So we're excited to continue working with the Claire Marie Foundation. Um, and I wanted to talk about one of their screening days. So they are incredible f- um, organization that really strives to raise awareness uh, for adolescent melanoma specifically. And they offer free full body screenings a couple of times a year. So they're, they just had one this past weekend, um, but there's one coming up on March 11th. Um, and it is a full body screening for anyone who is between ages 13 and 29. Um, and it's in Baltimore, Maryland, um, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we'll add a link in the show notes that you can click through and reserve a time. But the fact that this is a free full body check is huge because skin checks are not cheap. Um, I mean, they're just not cheap. So the fact that you could go somewhere, you have dermatologists who are dedicating um, their time. So they're completely volunteering their time to come and do these full body checks is really incredible. Um, One thing to note, you do have to reserve a time. uh, So make sure you do click through that link in the show notes and sign up for a time. Um, And if you're under 18, you must be accompanied by a guardian uh, for obvious reasons, you know. Um, And then I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's in Baltimore, Maryland. So if you're DC based, that's that's important to know. It's in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, so if you're around that area, definitely go and take advantage of this free resource. Just a quick question or just a quick thought, I should say. Um, I think this is an amazing initiative that they're taking because, you know, people aren't lucky enough. Not everyone is lucky enough to have health insurance that covers these kind of things. And I don't know the specifics, but I'm really hoping that it's free for literally anyone as long as they sign up. Mm -hmm. They don't need insurance, correct? Yep. That is my understanding. I don't think they collect anything, like even collect insurance, but I want to double check that before I say that out loud. But my understanding is, yep, as long as you reserve that time and you're between the ages of 13 and 29, um, it is completely free for you. Um, I don't think they take any information. I don't think there's any barriers for entry either. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's very, it's very good to hear. Yeah, I completely agree. I think they're doing incredible work. And like I said, uh, skin cancer screenings are so necessary, but they have barriers for entry normally. They're expensive. And even if you have insurance, you still have to pay um, a copay and, you know, other fees associated. So that's awesome. Um, Our second story is about our partner, the MRF, and it's about the DC Miles for Melanoma 5K is was announced. So the 2023 Miles for Melanoma 5K series will kick off the season in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, May 6th at Yards Park. So we're super excited because we're D.C. based and I went to the event for the first time last year and we had such a great time being surrounded by other melanoma survivors, advocates, caregivers um, to all spread awareness and education. Um, So the DC event registration page is now open. So you can sign up to walk the 5K, run the 5K, or if you're not located in DC, you can still donate um, and you can do kind of a virtual run situation. But they also have a ton of other locations. So they might be coming to a city near you. So definitely check out their website. Um, But just like last year, you can join our team. So when you go to register for the Miles for Melanoma event, you can search to join our team. So you can search low ultraviolet and select us and join our team and be part of part of our walking group. I'm not running, but I will walk it. Um, But we want to meet you guys if you're if you're local. Um, It's just a really fun event. And I think also, again, this is another organization that's doing an amazing job. Um, And considering that they're pretty much nationwide, I know they do have um, multiple Miles for Melanoma runs. So if you're not DC-based, fret not, because you can join your local Miles for Melanoma wherever you're located. I know one of our ambassadors, Leah, Leah Adams, 
um, mm-hmm. attends the Miles for Melanoma race in Cleveland every year. Um, I'm sure there's other investors who go to theirs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think every major city has one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they have a ton of them. I mean, the event has really, really grown. Um, I know DC, I hope I'm not making a false statement, but I think DC is one of the biggest ones because the MRF is located in DC. So I think we have Mm -hmm. a huge pull to this area, but they've really grown all of the miles for melanoma events over the past couple of years. I think uh, COVID really tried to mess it up. (laughs) You know, you're trying to grow an Mm in-person event and then COVID kind of threw, um, an obstacle in that way, but they're coming back better than ever. And it's just such a fun way to engage with the melanoma community. If you have maybe been going through skin cancer treatment or a loved one has been, and you just want to be surrounded by people who get it and are super supportive and get some free swag along the way, um, definitely consider joining one of the Miles for Melanoma events. All right. So to get into kind of the meat and potatoes of today's episode, we really wanted to talk about Black History Month and skin cancer awareness. So February is Black History Month, and Sigda and I were kind of talking before we started recording this episode that we feel like more and more companies are starting to kind of give awareness and education to different skin types and how skin cancer might present itself, but not as many as we would hope for. Um, So we decided that it's the perfect opportunity to have a conversation, kind of share some um, statistics and quotes and information and stories and have a really open and candid conversation about the risks, um, no matter your race, age, gender, all of the above. You know, there's a really popular quote about how skin cancer doesn't discriminate um, and that people of any race, age, or gender can be affected. And that is so true, but we still feel like information is kind of misaligned with that. There there is a lot of information for white Caucasian Americans who, yes, are highly at risk, but, you know, all races have potential for developing skin cancer and melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer. Um, So, According to the American Cancer Society, the lifetime risk of developing melanoma, so melanoma specifically, is 1 in 100,000 for Black Americans, 1 in 167 for Hispanic Americans, and 1 in 38 for White Americans. So I think it's really important to note that this stat is for the United States, right? So this is information collected by the American Cancer Society. So we're focusing on the U.S. You know, every country has their own healthcare system and their own statistics that they collect. Um, you know, I know in Australia, skin cancer risks are super high. So I did want to note that this is for the U.S. only. Um, and one stat that's, I mean, I just find it mind boggling is that the estimated five-year melanoma survival rate for Black patients is only 70% versus 94% for white patients. Um, And the source for that is the Skin Cancer Foundation. So I think you can take that that stat and you can break it down in a ton of different ways, right? You can break that down to the lack of information, the lack of resources. I mean, we all know that darker skin has more melanin in it. And that's the pigment that determines skin tone. And yes, having more melanin can absorb and deflect UV radiation, protecting the skin from sun damage. However, that does not mean that you cannot develop skin cancer. And the idea that people of color do not get melanoma is a myth. And it stands in the way really of raising awareness of melanoma and other skin cancers. You know, if you have that that notion in your head that, oh, I can't get melanoma or I can't get skin cancer, and then you're not checking for it, or even worse, if you're a dermatologist and you don't know what to look for, that's even scarier. I mean, we were talking about that before the show, Snigda, about dermatologists maybe not knowing what to look for in different races and skin tones. Yeah. And I think it's absolutely horrible that, you know, um, 
the risk exists for every patient. You can't discount anyone from, you know, having a chance of developing skin cancer because it can happen to anyone. And I guess that's true with any cancer for that matter. Um, but when it comes to melanoma specifically, um, I do know, well, I mean, this is what I've heard and I really hope that this has changed. Um, but when dermatologists are in training or in medical school and they're learning how to identify different skin um, conditions or disorders or whatever it might be, um, conditions, when they're taught how to visually identify these skin conditions, they only see pictures and diagrams of that specific condition shown on white Caucasian skin. Now, as a person of color, that angers me because I am relatively fair skin compared to a large majority of the world. But for the people who are darker skinned and who are discounted because, okay, you have more melanin in your skin, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how it works, right? right? You should be able to account for everyone and anyone. And I'm not saying that every dermatologist is like this. I'm not trying to villainize, you know, the entire no. profession or what they do. Of course, mm -hmm. we're extremely grateful for their knowledge and expertise. But mm -hmm. if this is the case, it's extremely disappointing because if it's one in a thousand, so be it. That one in a thousand case should be able to be caught and identified. Right. And I think this also comes up, um, I think it's called the 15% pledge or something similar along those lines. I completely misquoted that. And I know that for a fact, because I don't remember it off the top of my head, but the premise of that pledge is that the American population is approximately 15% black mm -hmm. and they want, the community wants to encourage you to spend 15% of your money at a black owned business because 15% of the population is black and you know, 15%, one in a thousand, you can do the math. That's still a lot of people considering our population mm -hmm. is upwards of 350 million. Right. And again, I know that everyone does not have access to health insurance um, or maybe not a dermatologist that they're, you know, have a good relationship with or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really important to tie back to the Claire Marie Foundation and what they're doing because having these, you know, free checkups is really important regardless of race, regardless mm -hmm. of where you are, um, for people to have access to that kind of check. And I just hope that that has changed, that, um, you know, dermatologists are only being trained right. to kind of identify conditions on Caucasian skin. And I'm sure it also comes with experience. Again, not to discount their profession and their expertise because they've put in a lot of work to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but I just hope that that has changed. And if not, hopefully very soon. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping too, you know, when we're talking about the training, that that only applies to a small amount of dermatologists that maybe are only being taught in textbooks with outdated imagery that only shows white skin. You know, I, I do think as a society, and I hope that this isn't overly optimistic, that we are working to be better in providing health care for all that is all encompassing. So that stat has always just really been sobering to me that the survival rate for black patients is only 70% versus 94% for white patients. I mean, that just shows how much of a gap there still is and how we need to educate ourselves and help to educate others. Um, you know, there is a stat that squamous cell is the most common skin cancer in black people. So teaching what squamous cell looks like if that is the most common versus melanoma. So maybe melanoma isn't as prevalent in black communities, which I don't think it is because I think it's the skin cancers that aren't as heavily tied to sun exposure, but that's skin cancer comes from multiple different sources. Some of them we might not even know. And only one of those sources is UV light and radiation and the sun. Um, so educating both ourselves and the greater community on that. I mean, I think such a impactful example of this is Bob Marley. And this is information from the Skin Cancer Foundation that I pulled that 
Bob Marley died from melanoma. And I feel like this is a widely known fact, which is a step in the right direction, right? Knowing that he died from melanoma um, when he was only 36 years old. And his melanoma was on his toenail. And he always attributed this dark spot under his toenail to an injury, a soccer injury that um, you know, just wasn't healing, nothing to it. It was just an, just a bruise under the toenail, an old soccer inj- injury. Um, and it was actually a very rare, um, aggressive form of skin cancer. And I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, but acaryl, acaryl litiginous melanoma or ALM. And I apologize if I mispronounce that. Um, I'll call it ALM from now on. Um, but according to AIM at Melanoma Foundation, ALM is a, is a specific type of melanoma that appears on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and under the nails. And this is a more common form of skin cancer for Black patients that I feel like needs to have more education surrounding it. So I feel like we do the ABCDEs and we tell people to look in their scalp and we tell them to, you know, look on their back and their shoulders but we're not remembering that skin cancer doesn't always show up where the sun shines. You know, it can be on different areas of the body. And I think it's so important that people, we were talking about this last week with our conversation with Dr. Brown. And when you go in for a skin check, you're supposed to remove your nail polish. And this is a prime example for why, so that you can actually see what's going on under your nails and areas that you wouldn't even think that might show cases of skin cancer, but very clearly is something that needs to have attention drawn to it. Yeah. And I do think uh, connecting back or calling back to the stat that you said that um, only about 70% of people who are diagnosed with skin cancer, um, or sorry, 70% of Black people who are diagnosed with skin cancer um, survive. I think, and I think this is simple logic, but I just want to call attention to it that if you are a smaller percentage of the population, logically, it would be easier to focus on a larger percentage of the population and make sure that, you know, that we can account for the majority of cases. Mm-hmm. But that does not mean you ignore the minority, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And I also think because there's such a, like, there's a high uh, survival rate uh, within white patients, mm-hmm. I think that discrepancy comes because... Again, I'm not discounting the profession of dermatology or oncology in general, but there is a higher chance, I'm assuming, of Mm -hmm. doctors kind of not seeing it at the right time, because obviously survival rates drop the further along you progress in the cancer, right? Whatever stage you're at. And it could have either, you know, metastasized by the time you catch it. Um, Maybe it's untreatable by the time you catch it, which is extremely unfortunate. Um, Mm -hmm. But that delay in diagnosing someone with skin cancer, I mean, even six months to a year can make a massive difference because we know the nature of cancer. It's, it's rapidly progressing in most cases. Yeah. I think that's so important to drive awareness to. And I think you hit the nail right on the head. I think that's why the survival rate is so much lower is it's getting caught so much later. And maybe that's for any number of things. Maybe that's, it wasn't recognizable on the skin or it didn't stand out as much or there was delay in going to see a doctor because of the lack of awareness that it's something that you could actually die from. That's very serious. I mean, mm-hmm. I think the delay is a hundred percent why that stats there. And, you know, as we always said, our job is to give everyone the information and the facts that they need to make informed decisions on their health. And I think it's interesting because I know I fit a profile of um, melanoma risk, um, because I am very pale. Um, I have blue eyes and I have blonde hair and I feel like everyone knows that stat, but we need to make people aware that like, Hey, guess what? That's not the only type of characteristics and skin tone and hair type that can develop this. And as we continue to grow as a society and companies like LUV are, you know, taking a personal stance and trying to spread education and awareness. I hope this is something that continues to grow. Um, 
as society and we continue to grow. Um, but I thought you had a very interesting example that kind of ties into this in terms of healthcare um, and and treatments. And it's a little bit different than skin cancer, but I think it ties in beautifully. Yeah. So I wanted to um, discuss the story and like the history of a dermatologist. He's an American dermatologist named Albert Klegman. He co-invented Retin-A, Retin-A, the acne medication, which is actually tretinoin, but it's marketed as Retin-A by Johnson & Johnson. Um, and he co-founded, or sorry, co-invented Retin-A with James Fulton in 1969. Now you might be asking yourself, why is he relevant? So he actually performed human experiments on inmates at the Holmesburg prison in Philadelphia, but scandal followed kind of years later. The experiments intentionally exposed humans to pathogens, so on and so forth, that are irrelevant to like skin cancer. Um, but it later became a textbook example of unethical experimenting on humans. Interestingly enough, he and others involved were sued for alleged injuries, but the lawsuit was dismissed due to the statute of limitations expiring. Wow. So. Now, the reason why I brought him up and how he kind of ties into Black History Month and skincare, um, the only reason why tretinoin, aka retin A, um, exists today and why it's sold and how its efficacy was proven, mm -hmm. most of the innovations were made possible because of ready made access or readily available access to the incarcerated Black men of Holmesburg Prison in Philadelphia. Um, and quote, Kligman paid prisoners money for their participation, a practice that by the 1970s was widely understood as coercion and corruption of consent. Today, ethical review right. boards restrict anything that is considered coercion. The exact harms to individual people are hard to track in some cases because records of who received what treatment are missing in many cases. Nevertheless, you can say that the legacy of experimentation on mostly black incarcerated people is a contributing factor to medical mistrust. And that is something that transcends mm -hmm. the people themselves and translates to the entire community. And now I think that is extremely horrible. First of all, I don't know how, um, I don't know how Kligman got past the prison system, but I'm assuming at the time, it was considered acceptable because the prisoners are getting money mm -hmm. for time that they've, or like a service, I guess, that they're yeah. providing to Kligman and, you know, his team. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring it up is because the majority of these men at Holmesburg prison in Philly, I mean, they're in prison. If you're now offering them money for an unethical experiment, they're not really going to care for how it looks or like the ethics behind it because now you're offering mm -hmm. money, hence why it's considered coercion. But, you know, when the story broke, I think this story broke after he died, which I, I could be wrong. Um, right. People were livid because, I mean, the majority of the people that he's testing on at that point, mm -hmm. forget about race, right. right? You're testing on humans, which is, unethical to begin with and now to find out that they mm -hmm. were incarcerated a yeah and they were majority black men you know it turns into a right. social issue you know a race issue mm -hmm. economic issue and also now it's medical so you know mm -hmm. anyone who's a skincare fiend like erica and myself or anyone in the skincare community will understand the that was ironic that you had an ambulance this. go by right right as you were saying that <laughs> I, I thought I could cover it up, but it's okay. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely horrible mm -hmm. to think that, you know, such a commonly available yeah. drug today. Yeah. And I think you just need mm -hmm. a prescription for tretinoin, if I'm not mistaken, from a dermatologist. So for anyone who was, you know, maybe now you know the origins of how tretinoin was proved to be effective. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. It's horrible that um, this happened in the past. And I know the saying yeah. is that history repeats itself, but I really hope in this case that it doesn't because it's not fair and um, yeah. 
should have been illegal to begin with. I'm not sure what, Mm -hmm. I don't know who overlooked what, when that happened. I would say there's a ton of levels of ethics now. And Um, so many, if you're going to do like clinical trials or you're going to do research, you have a whole system of ethical standards that you have to abide by in order to do that. Uh, You can't just be testing things on humans without their, I mean, this is, this is a whole nother case in itself, but this is not the first case of this kind. I mean, Henrietta Lacks was another example of that. Uh, She was born in Roanoke, Virginia, and I'm pretty sure that John Hopkins harvested her cells to do important cancer research. And it's one of the reasons that we have as much information about cancer now is because of her. And it was something where, I mean, you could read into it multiple different ways, but I'm pretty sure hers was in the 1950s. I have to double check on that. Um, was in the 1950s and no one asked for her consent to use those cells. Um, her family didn't even know it. Her family was never compensated for it. But huge strides to the medical system were made thanks to her unknowing contribution. Um, so, you know, the example you provided for the skin industry is very, very similar to the Henrietta Lacks situation, um, an example in the medical industry. And it's, I mean, it's something that, like you said, we hope we learn from history. And I do, I do want to say that I think incredible strides are being made. Um, but it's, it's something that it is important to educate yourself on the history and, where things have come from. Um, You shouldn't just be blindly looking at these things, not knowing of the the huge sacrifices that were unknowingly made behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important to kind of tie back to that 70% survival rate um, of black people who are diagnosed with skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a multifaceted issue. It's not something that's, you know, oh, the dermatologist didn't catch it. So that's why, like, it's just at 70%. Mm -hmm. We can't do anything unless we change dermatology training, which is not true at all. Um, I'm sure it contributes to the issue. Like, you know, their concerns are overlooked or maybe the doctor doesn't believe what they're saying or, you know, I'm sure that's part of it, right? We can't overlook that part of it. But there's also Mm -hmm. socioeconomic problems where... They don't have access to a dermatologist. They don't have insurance. They don't have the ability to pay the copay if they happen to have insurance, you know, whatever it might be. Um, And when cases like this or stories like this come out into the public about Henrietta Lacks or about um, Albert Klickman, the dermatologist, I know we touched on medical mistrust, but I feel like this is one of the factors that contributes to that 70% as well. If someone in if someone who is black reads about these things or hears about it, they are going to sit back in their, in their chair and say like, I, they don't treat my people properly. And I am a member of my community. I'm no exception to that. So why Mm -hmm. should I trust them? And it's a very logical question and it just sucks that that's how the system is because the system is so much larger and has so much money that we can probably never even kind of conceptualize in our mind. Like I know that's how much money they deal with. Um, So it's a multifaceted issue. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and black history month is the perfect time to do so. But I just encourage everyone to always fact check everything that you read, make sure that you're not reading, you know, biased information. And if you are learn to recognize the bias, um, and just be always aware and open to listening Agreed. to other people's stories. And I think, really you know, we are, we're hoping important. with this podcast, it helps spark some conversation. Um, change starts with us and the conversations that we push ourselves to have and maybe even put ourselves outside of our comfort zone to examine things that we are projecting. You know, if you're sharing stuff on social media, that is relevant for Caucasian skin. We'll also look at stuff that's prevalent and um, uh, 
I totally blanked on my word, but also look at things that are like prevalent in other skin types, you know, in Hispanic skin, how does skin cancer present itself? What are the types of skin cancer that are more commonly found? All of that stuff is stuff that we can challenge ourselves to research and look up and learn about so that when the next time we have a conversation with someone surrounding skin cancer, we have that information in the back of our pockets and we're as a whole, lifting up the entire skin cancer community as a reward for doing that, that work. Yeah. So hopefully this conversation is a good start and we hope you guys um, enjoyed it. Snigden and I really like doing the research on this and kind of pulling some of the facts that we now have in our back pockets. Um, but yeah, take February, um, Black History Month and throughout the entire year as we continue to, you know, head into the summer months when the sun is very prevalent to, um, yeah, continue to educate yourself. And thank you for joining us for this conversation. And we loved having the opportunity uh, to have a podcast and talk about this. It's so cool that we have a forum to, to talk about these things. It just, it feels like such a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's thanks to our community for the people who are, you know, always following in our every steps and, um, you know, always supporting us. And to touch on the raising awareness about um, Black History Month, it's important to acknowledge the progress that mm -hmm. we've made, but also acknowledge that there's a lot more work to be done. And it's in many, many fields, like it's a multifaceted issue. It's never just one thing that you fix and it's done. Like for example, this story about Albert Kligman, the dermatologist, I learned about this on TikTok. So you can imagine there are influencers and, you know, you know, regular mm -hmm. people who aren't influencers, um, you know, they're doing their best to spread knowledge and awareness about this. And there are things that aren't published in textbooks because, you know, they say history is written by the winners. It's never written by the losers because they never have a voice, they're silenced. So it's very important to, you know, be open to knowing that the history that you were taught in school or facts mm -hmm. that you were told by, you know, previous it's generations so might not always and be true. Thank you guys so for joining us that. for another week of the podcast. Uh, we're super excited to continue using this podcasting platform as a way to engage with you guys while you're uh, you know, on your commute to work or grocery shopping or picking up the kids from school, whatever it is. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your daily routine. And we will see you next week on the Ultraviolet Tide. Goodbye.